Hello and welcome to video two for week three. This video continues on the basic definitions that we started in the previous video. It talks more about what spans are and what type of objects they are. And that type of object is a linear subspace. So a linear subspace is some set of vectors in Rn that has two properties. And these should be familiar now because of the properties exactly what you would expect with the word linear. If I have two vectors, their sum remains in the set. So this is some set of vectors that anytime I have two vectors in them, I can add them together and I still remain in the same set. And if I have a vector and a scalar, if I scale the vector, it also remains in the same set. So as soon as I have a vector, all multiples of that vector remain in the set. And those two things algebraically give us the idea of linear subspace makes sense. It's a subspace, a subset that has all the linear properties, addition and scalar multiplication. So the type of things that have this property we think of points, at least the origin is a linear subspace. We can think of lines through the origin as linear subspace. We can think of planes through the origin as linear subspace. And in higher dimensions, we have higher dimensional analogs. But these are geometrically things that go through the origin, uh, things that are non-empty, include at least one point, and things that are flat and extend infinitely in some direction, like a line or a plane or a three-dimensional space in a, in a four or five-dimensional um, ambient space, these type of things. The spans that we defined before are always linear subspaces. So geometrically, in the last video, I said, well, what do spans mean? They mean linear subspaces. They give us points, lines, planes, and other similar higher dimensional analogs of these. We can also have the notion of an affine subspace. And this is a linear subspace with an offset. In the previous video, I also defined an offset span. I had a span, but then I could shift it by a vector. So same thing here, an affine subspace is a linear subspace L shifted by some vector V. And now this is possible to move away from the origin because linear subspaces have to go through the origin, but this offset adding a vector V can move the thing away from the origin. These are still flat, infinitely extended objects, but now I can have any point or any line, any plane, not necessarily through the origin. They still have to be non-empty. We can't have the empty set here as an affine subspace. One of the trickiest notions to define in geometric mathematics is the notion of dimension. And luckily for flat things, it's a little bit more reasonable than some of the subtleties that show up in dimension in, in different settings. But we want to talk, talk about the dimension of a linear subspace. And I can think of a linear subspace described as a span. Um, all linear subspaces are described as a span. And remember that a span was all linear combinations of some number of vectors. So I'm using all the definitions from the previous video, span, linear independence, linear combination. Those are fundamental definitions, and I need to use them throughout the rest of the course. But here is what dimension means. A linear subspace, a span, has dimension k. If it can be written as the span of k linearly independent vectors. Now remember that linear independence geometrically meant things moving in fundamentally different directions. So if something has dimension 4, it's going to be the span of 4 vectors, each of which are fundamentally going in new directions. A line has dimension 1, it's the span of 1 vector. A plane has dimension 2, it's the span of 2 vectors, as long as those two vectors are not on the same line. They're moving in a fundamentally different direction. The same definition works for the offset span. The offset doesn't change the dimension, so the offset just moves something, so the dimension does not change. These uh, k linearly independent vectors, so uh, it has dimension k if it is the span of these linearly independent vectors, these are called a basis. So a minimal spanning set is called a basis, the minimum number of vectors you need. A basis is not unique. A linear subspace will have many different bases, infinitely many different bases, um, but often it's us useful to fix a basis so that we can work with the description of something via that particular basis. And so if I ask you to determine a basis, what I'm asking you to do is to find a spanning set, so find a set of vectors that span the space, and then make sure that that set is linearly independent. There are some standard bases for Euclidean space, so let me talk about them here. The standard basis for R2 is the unit vector in the x direction and a unit vector in the y direction. So this vector length one and this vector length one and between those two vectors, we can get anywhere. We can go any multiple on the x-axis, we can go any multiple on the y-axis, 
and that gets us to any place in the plane. Any vector can be written as a linear combination of the basis. That's what a basis means. A basis spans the entire set, so anything in the set can be a linear combination of the basis. So let's show um, how this works. The vector 11, 5 is 11 times the vector in the x direction plus 5 times the vector in the y direction. So I can write 11, 5 as 11 times the first basis vector plus 5 times the second basis vector. This is a linear combination. I multiply the vectors by constants and add them up. That's the definition of linear combination. 11e1 plus 5e2 is a way of describing this as a linear combination of the basis vectors. A set is a basis if it's linear in, li linearly independent and any other vector can be written as a linear combination of it. Now this basis of R2 is not unique. As I said, there are infinitely many bases. I could take these two things as a basis. So that's the vector uh, 2, negative 2, and the vector 2, 2, and the vector 1, negative 1. So those are those two vectors. They point in fundamentally different directions. They're linearly independent. And I didn't uh, do the calculation for where I got these numbers from, but the vector 11, 5 can be written as 4 times this vector plus 3 times this vector, again, as a linear combination of the bases. And you could take any vector in the plane and write it as a linear combination of these two things if you figure out what the coefficients, in this case, 4 and 3, need to be. Similarly, there are bases for R3 and Rn. The standard basis for R3 is written E1, E2, E3, and that's the unit vector in the x direction, the unit vector in the y direction, and the unit vector in the z direction. Makes sense. R3 is three-dimensional. Basis has three elements. There are three axes to move along. And so any vector can be written as five times, or the vector five, negative six, negative nine, can be written as five times the first vector, plus negative six, six times the second vector, plus negative 9 times the third vector. It's a linear combination of the basis, and I can do that with any possible vector in R3. The similar thing works for Rn. We label these E1, E2, all the way up to En. So E1 points in the first axis direction, E2 points in the second axis direction, all the way down, En points in the n, nth or last axis direction. 